in the previous section, we discussed Green's theorem and looking at circulation and flux in a two-dimensional vector field. In this section, 6.5, we revert back to both two and three-dimensional vector fields. And we want to take a look at what's known as divergence and curl. Now, when we think about divergence, let's go ahead and imagine that we have a point P either in the plane, could be the XY plane, or it could be a point in three-dimensional space, so out here somewhere. If we want to think of what divergence is at the point P, we can think of it as a measure of the outflow of the vector field from the point. So we've got the vector field vectors coming into the point, and we've got vector field vectors leaving the point. So the divergence of the point is a measure of the outflow. So the vectors coming in are considered to be negative, and the vectors coming out are considered to be positive. So if we have more coming out of the point than we have going into the point, then we would say that the divergence is positive. But if we have more flow into the point than we have coming out of the point, then we would say that the divergence is negative. What if the flow is the same? For example, if you turn on the water faucet and you have a hose which is not restricted in any way, then the amount coming into the hose is the amount coming out of the hose. In that case, we would say that the divergence is going to be zero. Now we're going to learn how to relate divergence to source-free vector fields. Let's now think about what curl is. If a divergence is the measure of the flow out of a point, then the curl instead is a measure of the rotation of the vector field around the point. The curl turns out to be the vector around which it might be rotating. So in this case, it's not actually flowing out of the point, it's staying in place and rotating, sort of like a leaf caught in a whirlpool in a river. We'll learn to relate curl to conservative vector fields. So when we need uh, talk about divergence and curl, these have a lot of applications in fluid mechanics, electromagnetism, um, elasticity theory, gravitational fields, and so on. We'll need divergence and curl in order to be able to develop higher dimensional analogs of the fundamental theorem of calculus. We were able to develop a two-dimensional one with Green's theorem, but if we want to carry it into the third dimension, and we need divergence and curl to do it. We do have quite a few learning objectives in this particular section, namely that we want to determine the divergence from the formula for a given vector field. Now divergence as a measure of the outflow from a point, if it's a, say a velocity vector field representing the flow of a liquid at some point, the divergence is the amount of volume per unit time. So it could be like five gallons per minute or something flowing out of a point. Then we want to imagine and find the curl vector from the formula for a given vector field. Divergence is a scalar, whereas curl is a vector. So divergence is a measure of the net flow out of a point whereas curl is the vector around which it tends to be just sitting there rotating in a circle. So not flowing in, not flowing out, just rotating in place. Then we're gonna use the properties of curl and divergence to determine whether or not a vector field might be conservative or source-free. Divergence is related to source-free vector fields and curl is related to conservative vector fields. Allow me to share my screen with you and we'll get started first with divergence. Now we've already defined divergence as this net flow out of a point for the vector field. So vectors coming in, vectors coming out. If we have more flow out of the point than we have into the point, we have positive divergence. So it's a measure of that sort of net flow at a particular point in the vector field. Let's suppose that we have a three-dimensional vector field given by PQR in three dimensions, 
and we have the first partial derivatives of each component in order. So the partial derivative of P with respect to X, partial of Q with respect to Y, and the partial of R with respect to Z. Then we define the divergence of F, this measure of the net outflow from a point, to be given by the partial of P with respect to X plus the partial of Q with respect to Y plus the partial of R with respect to Z all added together. So we would find these partial derivatives and then substitute the values at our particular point, the X, Y, Z components of the point to get a number. And this number would represent the net outflow from that point. We represent divergence of a vector field with DIV and then F for the vector field or V, whatever the name of it is. We have a similar definition in R2. If we have a two-dimensional vector field, P comma Q, then again, we need to have the first partial derivative of P with respect to X and the first partial derivative of Q with respect to Y. If that's the case, then we define the divergence to be the sum of those two partial derivatives evaluated at a particular point we'll be able to find a formula to compute the divergence at any point in a vector field. And then we'll also be able to evaluate it at a particular point in the vector field. The next thing we want to take a look at is the way that the notation can be represented. Since we're applying the partial derivatives, but only with respect to the variable whose component it represents, in other words, the first component is the i hat component, so we integrate with respect to x, or integrate, take the derivative with respect to x. The second component is the j hat component, so we take the partial derivative with respect to y. And if we have a three-dimensional vector field, the third component is with respect to k, so we take the derivative with respect to z. In this sense, we can sort of think of the del operator as applying the partial with respect to the corresponding variable component by component for a 2D or a 3D vector field. If we think of it as sort of this operator of partial derivative with respect to a particular variable, then we can represent the divergence of the vector field as del dot f. Remember that the divergence is these partial derivatives added together. So if we apply the gradient operator, which takes the partial derivatives with respect to the appropriate variables and then add them together, it is sort of like a dot product. It's not truly a dot product because del is an operator, it's not a vector. But we write this as a shorthand for the divergence of f. We now want to consider what I would call the circle view of divergence. So let's suppose that we have a loop. So we're going to have this loop, and I'm going to try to find something that I can use to make a loop. So hang on while I locate a loop of some kind. So now that I've got my prop to demonstrate the circle view of divergence, we want to consider the two vector fields here in these images. In the two images, both of these vector fields have a divergence of zero. That doesn't mean there's no flow. There clearly is flow in both of these vector fields. The one on the left is a constant vector field. I believe it's given by one comma two. And that means that at every point in the two-dimensional plane, the vector from the vector field is exactly one comma two. It's the same vector everywhere, which means that if we take a flexible loop, like this loop that I have here made out of wire, and I put it into the vector field, and I consider the point at the center to be my point P, then the amount of flow into the loop is the same as the amount of flow out of the loop. So the amount coming into point P is the same as the amount leaving point P. That gives us a divergence of zero. In CalPlot 3D, you'll see divergence represented by a red loop 
around a point at the center. That center point is your point P. And then it will give you vectors leaving and entering the loop. So in this case, our vector field is flowing up and to the right, which means if I put my loop in here, they're coming into the loop on this end right here and coming out of the loop on this side right here. And because I have the same amount coming in as coming out, the loop remains perfectly circular. When the divergence is zero, the loop does not deform. Now in the one on the right, which is not a constant vector field since the vectors have different lengths at different points, but it is a radial vector field. If I were to drop a point or a leaf into this vector field, it's gonna to wanna to rotate in a circle, all right? And when we look at it rotating in a circle, what's gonna happen is that on a radial vector field, the, which is sort of like a hurricane, the vectors along a fixed distance from the center are all of the same length. So again, the flow is gonna be in a circular pattern, but because it follows that circular pattern at a fixed radius from the center, all the vectors coming in are the same length as the vectors coming out. And that means again, that the divergence is zero, even though it's not a constant vector field. And again, we can tell um, the representation in calc plot 3D with these sort of maroon brown vectors coming into the loop and the green shaded vectors leaving the loop. Let's go ahead and take a look at these over here in calc plot 3D so you can see how to enter them and get a better feel for what divergence is. When I look at these on CalCLOT 3D, we're going to look first at the one on the left. So this is my constant vector field in the two-dimensional plane, 1, 2. Now to see divergence, what I want to do is click inside the box for the vector field. I have the box for restrict view to 2D checked. I'm using a constant primary color, and I want to click on divergence at a point. When I click on divergence at a point, and then I click anywhere within the two-dimensional plane, I'm going to get this circle with the center representing point P and vectors coming into the circle and leaving the circle in the direction of the flow of the vector field. I'll also see calculated down here in the lower left and up in the green ribbon as well, that the divergence at that particular point is zero. Now, suppose I want the divergence at a particular point. I know the point I want. It's difficult to click and get exactly the right point. So we'll click on the 2D trace plane by clicking on the third graph icon. When that opens up, you'll see that I have options for X, Y, and Z. I'm in the two-dimensional plane, so Z will stay zero and I'm gonna check this at the ordered pair one comma one. And when I do that, notice again that, oh, I need to hit return so it calculates. Notice again, the divergence is still zero. Now, what if you're having trouble figuring out which way the vector field is flowing? So you can tell whether or not the vectors coming into the loop are the same length as the vectors coming out. In order to see the flow of the vector field, Click on object at 2D click point and click on flow line solution curve. Now, because this is a constant vector field, no matter where I click, it should move up and to the right at the relationship of one comma two. And if you click anywhere in here, you're going to see that no matter where I click, that is the flow of the vector field. Let's go ahead and take a look at our second image. And again, we want to see what's happening at a particular point. Let's first take a look at the flow lines. So if I click at a particular point, this is showing that because it's a radial field, that a leaf dropped in here or a point is going to flow in a circle. But along a circle of fixed radius, the vectors all have the same length. So the amount coming in and the amount coming out will be identical which means the divergence will be zero. If I go out, I have a larger radius and a longer vector, but 
at that distance from the center of the vector field, I have a radius of the same amount. Let's now look at the divergence at a point. If we click on the divergence at a point, notice that this red loop, which is sort of like our loop that we have here, is gonna flow in a circle like this, always staying at the same distance from the center of the vector field. And at that distance, vectors in equal vectors out. And so we have that the net flow at a point is zero. And again, you can find that by clicking anywhere in the vector field. <clears throat> now let's take a look at a different vector field. This is the vector field negative x, negative y, which is a radial vector field. So in this sense, it's not um, a rotational vector field where it's going in a loop. Instead, it acts along a radius. So this is sort of like the sun with rays coming out. But in this case, all the rays are coming into a single point. So you can think of this as a gravitational field where everything is being attracted to this. However, this one is a little different from a gravitational field in that the closer you get to the center, the less the magnitude of the velocity field is or the magnitude of the vector field. So you have a stronger magnitude when you're further away. The vectors are longer when they're further away from the center than when they're closer to the center. In this case, if we drop our loop in, we need to visualize where the loop is going to flow. So let's suppose I dropped my loop out here. Because the flow of the vector field is directly towards the origin, it's going to flow this way. If I drop it out here, it's going to flow directly towards the origin so that it gets the center at the origin. No matter where it is, it's going to flow directly towards the origin. In this case, though, the length of the vector coming into the loop is not equal to the length of the vector leaving the loop. So let's put my loop up here. Notice that the flow is going to be towards the origin, and the length of the vectors coming into the loop are longer than the length of the vectors leaving the loop. This means that the back of the loop is going to move faster than the front, which is going to compress the loop like this. In this case, we say that it has negative divergence because I have more coming into the point than I have leaving the point. And notice that this deformed loop, sort of like an oval, kind of looks like this shape right here. So in a sense, I've lost area, which means that it is negative divergence. I've got faster vectors at the back than I have leaving the front, so I have negative divergence. Let's take a look at this one out here on CalcPlot 3D. When we look at this one on CalcPlot 3D, closing up the ones I don't need, you'll see that we've got a divergence at a particular point given by negative two. Now, this one is a radial field. So what do you suppose might happen if I click on a different point? Notice that the divergence is still negative two. And this is common in a radial field where the divergence is going to be a constant because it is the same directed towards the origin. So when I'm looking at this one, it doesn't matter where I click, I again get that the divergence is negative two. Again, it's negative because if I place my loop in here, the back of the circle is moving faster, which pushes the back forward, but the front is moving slower where the front is in the direction of flow, and that gives me a compressed um, circle, all right? So it's compressed. It's really more like an oval, I guess you could call it. So let's now take a look at a different vector field. This is a similar vector field to the last one, but instead of negative x, negative y, it's positive x, positive y. So what effect would that have on the flow of the vector field. So let's come out here and we'll correct or change our vector field to be positive x, positive y, and hit enter so that it plots it. And then again, if you want to know what the flow is at any point, 
it looks like this one is also radial, but it's going to flow away from the origin. So wherever you put it, it's going to flow directly away from the origin along a radial line. So if you're looking, no matter where you look, it's coming directly away from the origin um, along a radial line, as if it were on some kind of radius of a circle, all right? Now let's take a look at the divergence at a particular point. I'm going to predict that because it's a radial field that I again am going to get a constant value. But this time, if I take my circle and I put the circle into the flow, the flow is away from the origin. So my circle, the vectors coming into the circle are shorter and the vectors leaving the circle are longer. So it's going to elongate it this way. So it adds area. So instead of compressing the circle, it elongates the circle. The front of the circle is moving faster than the back of the circle, which tends to stretch it out and make the area larger. So I'm going to predict that the divergence will be positive. And in fact, because it is the same vector field as before, but with opposite signs, we find that it does turn out to be two. And again, remember the definition of divergence is the partial of the first component with respect to x, which would give us one, plus the partial of the second component with respect to y, which would give us another one added together. So the divergence in a radial vector field like this one is going to be a constant value no matter what, no matter which point I'm at, it's always going to give me two. Let's now take a look at a definition of what's called incompressible. If I take a vector field like the constant vector field or the rotational field we saw earlier, and I put my loop into the field, the shape of the circle remains completely circular. The flow into the point is the same as the flow out. So it neither compresses the circle nor elongates the circle. So I don't get negative area or positive area, it just stays the same. So the net change in area is zero, which means the divergence is zero. In this case, we call the fluid incompressible or the vector field incompressible. Now, if it's going to be incompressible, it has to be incompressible at all points. So when we're thinking about being incompressible, the fact that the divergence is zero at one point, but not everywhere else, does not make the vector field incompressible. It needs to be incompressible everywhere. So let's take a look at the first two that we looked at. If I imagine these two vector fields and I take the partial of the first component with respect to x, I get zero. And the partial of two with respect to y is also zero. So it doesn't matter where I am here, the divergence of the vector field is uniformly zero at all points. Then this is an incompressible vector field. No matter where I drop my loop, it's never going to be anything but perfectly circular. The same is true of the rotational vector field on the right, negative y comma x. In this case, when I take the partial of negative y with respect to x, I get zero. And the partial of x with respect to y is also zero. So that the formula for the divergence of the vector field does not actually depend on x or y where you are located in the vector field. It's uniformly zero, which makes this vector field also incompressible. No matter where you put the loop, it's going to stay perfectly circular. Let's take a look now at examples one and two. In example one, we're given a vector field of 2xy comma 5 minus y squared comma x squared plus y. First, we want to find a formula for the divergence of the vector field at any point x, y, z. Then we want to specifically find the divergence at 1, 1, 1. And then we'll interpret this result. Basically, we're going to determine whether or not the vector field is completely incompressible at all points. In example two, we have a similar vector field, but not the same.
we have x y comma five minus z squared y comma x squared plus y squared. We again want to find a formula for the divergence of f at any point in the three dimensional vector field x y z, and then we want to evaluate it at one one one. And again, we want to determine whether or not this vector field is uniformly incompressible at all points. Go ahead and pause the video now and remember to apply del dot f to find the divergence of f. When you're done, turn the video back on and we'll look at our results together. Let's go ahead and look at example one. To find the divergence of f, we take del dot f, which applies the partial with respect to x of component one to x1, leaving us 2y. We add to this the partial with respect to y of the second component, 5 minus y squared, which gives us a minus 2y. Then we add to that the partial with respect to z of the third component, x squared plus y. But it doesn't depend on z, so it is considered a constant as far as z is concerned, and it gives us 0. 2y minus 2y is 0 which means that our formula does not actually depend on x, y, or z, which means that it is independent of where you are. In this particular vector field, the divergence is going to be zero at all points. That makes the vector field incompressible. Let's go ahead and look at this vector field and see what it looks like in CalcPlot 3D. In CalcPlot 3D, I went ahead and evaluated it at 111. Evaluating it at 111 is still going to give me zero because it's zero everywhere. However, you can see in this case that the vectors are coming in at different angles. So the divergence is coming off. When we look at this, we can see by looking in the ribbon at the top that the divergence at point 111 is in fact zero. Now, this one is a little bit of a confusing vector field. You might try dividing. I think I divided by 8, but you might try dividing by something larger, like maybe 10 or even 12, in order to try to get a better feel for what the flow is in the vector field. When the vectors are overlapping, it's hard to tell the flow. Now we want to go ahead and evaluate the divergence at a particular point. So I'm going to click inside the box for the 2D trace plane and hit enter. Now this is what it is at 111, but I can use the slider bars to move around with respect to X. And when I do so, it never changes the divergence. If I change the Y's, again, it's always going to be zero. And if I change the Z's, it's always zero as well. Now, remember that when we do this, we're thinking of this as a loop in the plane. So that's why all of our vectors are coming off like this. Let's now take a look at the second example. In example two, we have a slightly different vector field. The partial of x, y with respect to x is y, plus the partial with respect to y of 5 minus z squared y is negative z squared. The last component, x squared plus y squared, does not depend on z, so its partial with respect to z is again zero. However, my formula for the divergence of the vector field tells me that it depends on the value of y and z. It's independent of the value of x, but not y and z. Now, if I want to know if there are points where the divergence is zero, I would want to know where y minus z squared equals zero, which is going to happen, of course, on a parabola in the yz plane, y equal to z squared. However, it is not going to be incompressible at all points. It is not uniformly zero everywhere, so we do not say that the vector field is incompressible. When we evaluate it at 111, it does turn out that the divergence at that point is zero because it is on the parabola y equals z squared. Let's take a look at this one now.
When we look at y equals z squared, we can see that at 1, 1, 1, the divergence is zero. Let's vary the y and note that the divergence changes since it depends upon y. Notice how now it is no longer zero, it is changing. If I change z, likewise, it should change. If I change the value of x, however, it is not going to change because it's independent of x. Now, if I want to find another point where this is true, I just need to make sure it meets the definition of y equals z squared. So if I chose a z value of 2, then my y value would need to be 4, y equal to z squared. And when I hit enter, you see that in this case, the divergence is zero because it's on that parabola. And if I vary the x, it's not going to change. Oops, I very, I'm very, uh, sorry, I moved off my spot. <laughs> and so it is, okay, as I change x, it varies and it's not the same, but I forgot to put in four. I changed my location. There we go. Now I'm there. And let's go ahead and change just x. Oh, it keeps, that's weird. It keeps changing my y equal 2 into y equal 4, maybe because I'm not pushed out far enough. Eeks, yikes, that's bad. Okay, so if I have something like this, maybe I need to divide by 15 since I've moved out some. So, okay, that's better. And now let's see if it will allow me to keep the y value at four. All right, so if I do that, now it's in my region and my divergence is zero. And as I move x, it is independent of x. And so it remains divergence is zero, All right? Let's look at a couple of applications for divergence. In physics, we use divergence to determine whether or not a vector field is magnetic. Gauss's law for magnetism says that if B is a magnetic field, then del dot B is zero. In other words, the divergence of the vector field for a magnetic field is zero. That means that all magnetic fields are in fact incompressible. If you toss the loop into the vector field, it remains perfectly circular. The flow in and out of the point is exactly the same in a magnetic vector field. Now we want to think about whether or not a vector field is source free depending on the divergence. So when we look at this one, recall from section 6.4 that in a source free field, the flux around a closed curve is zero. Now we have a closed loop and it doesn't have to be circular. It could be any kind of loop. And we're looking at the flux, which is the flow across. Well, gosh, that sounds a lot like divergence, doesn't it? It is. So we have the flux across a closed curve being zero. And we're now going to relate this idea of the flux to the idea of divergence. So our first theorem states that the divergence of a source-free vector field with differentiable components has a divergence of zero. So in two dimensions, if P comma Q is a source-free continuous vector field, remember flux is defined in two dimensions, and so we have a two-dimensional vector field, it has to have continuous components that are differentiable, and if that's the case, then the divergence of that source-free field is zero which should make sense to you because if it's a source-free field, the flux across the closed curve is zero, meaning the net outflow is zero. The proof of this is starting with the definition of a source-free field, that there exists a function g of x, y, such that the partial of g with respect to y is p, and the opposite of the partial of g with respect to x is q. This allows us to write the vector field in terms of this function g as g partial of g with respect to y comma negative partial of g with respect to x. However, remember that the vector field has differentiable components, which means we can take the second partial derivative of function g. 
The first one would be the partial of G with respect to Y first and then X. And the partial of the second component would be negative the partial of G with respect to X and then Y. However, we also said that they're continuous. And because they're continuous, we know by Clairaut's theorem that the cross partial derivatives, second derivatives must be equal to each other, which means that the partial of G with respect to Y then X equals the partial of G with respect to X then Y, which means that the divergence, which is the difference of the two partials must be equal to zero. Now the converse of this turns out to be true, but only for simply connected regions. Remember, a simple region is a region that does not have a hole in it. So when we're looking at this, not simple if it has a hole in it. Connected means you can get from point A to point B without leaving your particular vector field. If we let F equal to P comma Q be a continuous vector field, so P and Q are continuous, with differentiable component functions, so I can take the partials of P and Q, with a domain that is simply connected, then the divergence of the vector field is zero if and only if it's source free. So, so long as we have a domain that does not have a hole in it and is connected, then we know that being source free is equivalent to saying the divergence of the vector field is zero. We're now ready to work example three, where we're given a vector field in two dimensions, negative ay comma bx, which is a rotational field, so it moves in a circular pattern, where a and b are both positive constants. We want to know, is the vector field source free? Now, in order to know that it's source free, we have to make sure that the domain of the vector field is simple and connected. Otherwise, being source free doesn't mean the same as divergence being zero. If that's the case, then we need to look at the domain of the vector field. But both of these component functions are simply linear. And so the domain of both of them is going to be all of R2. R2 is open, simple, and connected. So we know the domain is open, simply connected. When we think about the vector field, we also have to have the conditions that the component functions are continuous. However, they're both linear, so lines are continuous everywhere since they're polynomial, so it's continuous. We also have to have the partial derivatives. In other words, the component functions have to be differentiable. If we look at minus ay and we take the derivative with respect to x, we get zero. The derivative of bx with respect to y is likewise zero. And this means that the divergence of the vector field is zero. And it meets the conditions to apply the theorem, which means, of course, that our vector field is source free. I've gone ahead and written down the three conditions that we have to meet in order to apply the theorem that source free means the same thing as divergence of the vector field is zero. Once we have this, we use the divergence of the vector field to prove that it's zero, which implies, of course, that the vector field is source free. Taking the partials with respect to x, of the first component and the partial with respect to y of the second component, adding them together gives us zero everywhere in the vector field. So it is in fact source free. It is an incompressible vector field and it is source free. We now wanna take a look at relating divergence to flux through Green's theorem. Let's take a look at the definition of Green's theorem that we learned in section 6.4. Remember that we had quite a few conditions. I always think of it as four, three, two. So I have four conditions on the closed curve. One, that it is piecewise smooth. 
that it is simple. So piecewise smooth, it can have corners, but it has to have a finite number of them. And C1 plus C2 plus C3 has to eventually close up the loop. Simple means it doesn't intersect itself. So no figure eights, right? Closed means I have to be able to start and stop in the same location and make one continuous loop around. And then I generally want it oriented counterclockwise, which is the positive direction. That's four conditions for the curve. Then the region has three conditions, open, simple, and connected. In this case, since Green's theorem only applies in two dimensions, simple means that you have a domain that doesn't have a hole in it. Connected means you can walk from anywhere inside the domain to anywhere else in the domain without having to leave the domain. We can't have Colorado here and Hawaii over there. It's gotta be like Colorado to um, Kansas. We can stay within the continental US and walk directly from one to the other without leaving the continental US. If we have a vector field PQ, and then we have our two conditions on the vector field, that the component functions are continuous, that's one, and they have partial derivatives, that's two. And it's on this open region containing D, which meets our open simply connected region requirements, then we can say that the flux around a closed curve, F dot the unit normal vector with respect to the arc length differential, which we can also write as negative Q dx plus P dy, which becomes flux, of course. And it can also be translated into a single integral with respect to a parameter T by parameterizing the curve as R of T, finding F of R of T and dotting it with a normal vector, not a unit normal vector necessarily, but just any normal vector. If we let R of T be X of X of T and comma Y of T, then a normal vector would be Y prime of T negative X prime of T. Once we have this, we found through Green's theorem that this line integral around a closed curve is equal to a double integral on the region inside the curve of the partial of P with respect to X plus the partial of Q with respect to Y. But by definition now, this partial of P with respect to X plus the partial of Q with respect to Y is in fact the divergence. So we have a line integral around a closed curve of flux equal to a double integral over the region inside the curve of the divergence with respect to the area differential. We can now rewrite Green's theorem in terms of the divergence of the vector field by relating the flux across a closed curve to on a line integral to the double integral on the region inside the curve of the divergence of F with respect to the area differential. So this is again a sort of an analog of the fundamental theorem of calculus where we're saying that the derivative, sort of derivative of F, which is the divergence on a region, can be found by computing a line integral only using the boundary, in the same way that we can find information about the antiderivative function by evaluating it only on the boundaries, A and B, for a, an integral of a single variable. We're now ready to take a look at example four. For example four, we're given a velocity vector field V of XY equal to negative XY comma Y, where the Y values are always strictly positive. We wanna find all points within the vector field, such that the amount of fluid flowing into a point is the same as the amount leaving the point. In other words, we want to find locations where the divergence at the point is equal to zero. So the first thing we'll want to do is find a formula for the divergence of this vector field at any point. And then we want to set it equal to zero and solve to find where it is always going to be zero.
Pause the video now to work this out, then turn the video back on and we'll compare our results. So to find the divergence, we apply the del operator to the vector field, del dot v. We take the partial with respect to x of component one, negative x, y, to get negative y, and add to that the partial with respect to y of component two, which is y, which gives us plus one. So this gives us a divergence formula of negative y plus one. Now this is only going to equal zero if the y value equals one. So let's go ahead and take a look at this interesting vector field in CalcPlot 3D. When we look at the vector field, you can see that the flow is sort of, well, depending on which way you are, you're dropped in and then you flow up and towards the positive y-axis. So the flow, depending on which side of the y-axis you're on, is gonna draw you up and towards the y-axis. And again, you can find this by clicking on object at 2D clicked point, selecting flow line solution curve, and clicking on different locations. No matter where you are, it's being drawn up along the positive Y axis. Let's now take a look at the divergence within this field by selecting divergence at a point. Then we can click on a point. Notice that the, the divergence at this point is not zero, it's negative 1.29. At most locations inside of this vector field, I do not have a divergence of zero. This is not an incompressible field, but there are locations within this vector field where the divergence is zero, namely when y equals one. Click on the 2D trace plane, and enter in that y equals one. When you do that, notice that instantly it changes the divergence to being zero. If I then want to vary my x coordinate, I can slide along the line where y equals one, and at all points, the divergence is zero. So along the line y equal one, it is incompressible, but it is not incompressible at all points. We're now ready to talk about the second major concept in this section, which is curl. So if divergence measures the net flow at a point, a measure of the outflow at a point, then we think of curl as a measure of the vector field's tendency to rotate in place and not to flow through the point. So unlike the divergence, which is a scalar, a number, the curl is instead a vector. So if we think of the vector field as representing a fluid, then the curl at point P, which is in the center of this paddle wheel, measures the vector field's spin at that point. So if we put the paddle wheel in here with the axis aligned with the curl vector, then the curl measures the tendency of the paddle wheel to rotate about the curl vector. So in this case, the normal vector, which is coming up out of the plane, is in fact the curl vector. So if you have a 2D vector field and you use your right hand to put it in the direction that the vector field is flowing, your thumb should point in the direction of the curl vector. Now let's take a look at one of the vector fields we had before, which was the constant vector field one comma two. In this case, the vector field is constant and there's no spin. No matter where I drop this particular paddle wheel, which is represented with red spokes about a blue point in calc plot 3D, then I notice that it, well, it doesn't move. So let's take a look at what it looks like in a vector field where it does move compared to a vector field where it does not move. So we're gonna take a look at both of these. So the first thing I wanna do is show you what it looks like when it moves. Now it doesn't work terribly well when I'm sharing the screen. So I'm gonna unshare the screen and we'll take a look at it um, directly.
So in this case, I'm looking at the previous vector field. I'm going to click on object at 2D clicked point, and I'm going to do curl at a point. Click a point and drop your little paddle wheel into the vector field. Notice that it is, in fact, rotating in a circle. Right here, it's rotating in a clockwise circle. What this tells me is that there is a tendency for rotation around the single point at this point in the vector field. If you want to know what the curl vector is, since it's in two dimensions, then it's going to have to point in the direction of k. And it makes sense that it's negative 1.57k, because if I put my right hand in the direction of rotation, my thumb, of course, is going to point, well, I can't, I'm in the negative direction. Now, our plane, of course, is this direction, so it would be like this, and it would be pointing down, all right? So the xy plane right now is right here, so k is actually into the board. Notice that it is spinning. Now, if I move it to a different location, it spins with a different speed. In this case, a lower um, value on the vector, so negative 0.7854. So in this case, there's less tendency to rotate in place, but again, it's rotating in a clockwise direction. If I click over here, I might find that it moves faster, and this time it's rotating in a counterclockwise direction, so it's going to point in the direction of positive k, and I get 1.04k. If I put this directly on the y-axis, and I didn't quite hit the y-axis because it's still wanting to move ever so slightly. All right, I think I got it on there. Not quite. Let's just go ahead and set it. X equals zero. And if I do that, notice that it stopped spinning altogether. And that's because along the positive y-axis, the flow is directly up. So there's no sideways twist to it. There's no torque to it. It doesn't make it tend to want to spin in place. Let's now look at the one that we had in our example in the lecture notes, which is the constant vector field, 1, 2. If I click at different locations, notice that it is not rotating. And that's because the flow is directly up and to the right. And again, it's not coming at an angle, so it's not tending to want to make it spin. So the idea is this. If you take a leaf and you drop the leaf into the fluid, it's going to flow with the same orientation all the way across. It's never going to change the orientation of that particular leaf. On the other hand, if we look at the one we were looking at before, and let's say that I click over here, then what it's saying now is that not only is it going to tend to flow up towards the positive y-axis, but it's also going to rotate as it moves up and towards the positive y-axis. So try to visualize in your head that you have a leaf floating downriver along the flow of the vector field, but at the same time, it's circling in place as it flows down the river. So it's flowing down the river following up the positive y-axis and rotating in place. So again, rotating, 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 all right? So it has two motions, if you will. Let's consider the vector field negative y comma x. We saw this one earlier in this video when we were looking at divergence. We know that this is a rotational field, and we know that the divergence at any point is going to be zero because at a fixed distance from the center of the vector field, the uh, divergence is zero. The length of the vectors coming in is the length of the vectors coming out. The curl, however, is different, and you might expect that because in a rotational field, it's going to want to flow in a circle. 
And because it flows in a circle, it's going to tend to spin that leaf in the circle as well. Let's take a look at that one now, which is here, I believe. All right. So we can see that this one is flowing. And I would expect that at every point, it's going to flow in the counterclockwise direction because the entire vector field is flowing in the counterclockwise direction. Now, when the vectors are shorter, we get different values. And notice that coming out here, the lengths of the vectors are going to affect um, the radius of the vector field. So the closer towards the center, the shorter the vectors are, the further out, the longer they are. But notice that it's not affecting either the divergence or the curl. The divergence is gonna be zero in this rotational field, but the curl is always 2K. Now, why would that happen? Well, we haven't discussed the formula yet, so you're not able to actually predict that yet. So let's go ahead and discuss the formula. So when we talk about curl, the formal definition of it, and we're gonna start in a three-dimensional vector field, P, Q, and R, we have a similar definition in two dimensions, um, where the components are continuous and differentiable. So the partial of P with respect to X, partial of Q with respect to Y, partial of R with respect to Z all exist. Then we define the curl of F to be the partial of R with respect to Y minus the partial of Q with respect to Z in the I hat direction, plus the partial of P with respect to Z minus the partial of R with respect to X in the J hat direction, plus the partial of Q with respect to X minus the partial of P with respect to Y in the K hat direction. Now, when we're looking at this, you may think to yourself, gosh, I, I feel like I've seen these before somewhere. And you have. When we were studying conservative vector fields, these were called the cross partials. And again, remember that P is in the X position, the I hat component. Q is in the Y position, the J hat component. And R is in the Z position, the K hat component. The cross partials are given by taking the partial of P with respect to Y and the partial of Q with respect to X. Now, this should raise some alarm bells for you because if you have a conservative vector field, it has the cross partial property, which tells you that all these cross partials are equal to each other. And if they're equal to each other, each of the components here of I, J, and K become zero. And that must mean that the curl of a conservative vector field is in fact zero, but it won't be zero the scalar, it'll be zero the zero vector since curl is a vector. Note that this also means, oddly enough, that the curl of a vector field is in fact a vector field. Since the curl of a vector field can be written as a vector depending on x, y, and z, then we can consider the curl to be a vector field in its own right. Now, there is an easier way to compute the curl of a vector field rather than trying to memorize the cross partials. Even with this diagram on the right, it can be difficult to remember which order to go in. What we do instead is we use the gradient as an operator again. And instead of computing del dot f as we did for divergence to get a scalar, we're gonna compute del cross f. And you know the cross product always gives you a vector. And so in this case, we're gonna allow row one to be i, j, k, row two to be the partial operator del partial with respect to X, then respect to Y, then respect to Z. And the third row will actually be the vector field. And what we're going to do is find the determinant of this three by three like matrix. Now it is not truly a three by three matrix. In a three by three matrix, all nine components would be constant scalars. However, in this case, I've got IJK, which is a vector, PQR, which are scalar valued functions, and 
the partials with respect to x, y, and z, which is an operation taking the partial. So it's not really a three by three matrix, but the process is going to be the same. So remember that you have two methods of applying this. You can expand by a row or column. In this case, you will always want to expand by i, j, k. And then cross out, for example, column one and row one and multiply i hat by the two by two determinant of what's left. Then j hat, which is in the first row, second column, one plus two is three, so it's odd. So you get minus j hat, cover up column two and row one and take the the determinant of the two by two of what's left. So that would be the partial with respect to X of R minus the partial with respect to Z of P. And this will produce that formula of the cross partial differences that we saw previously. Now, let's suppose we're in a two dimensional vector field. Well, then it's a much simpler formula. In that case, our vector field is just PQ. And we have the partial of P with respect to X and the partial of Q with respect to Y have to both exist in order to compute this. Then we define the curl to be the partial of Q with respect to X minus the partial of P with respect to Y multiplied by the K um, standard basis vector, 0, 0, 1, all right? And this will um, pull it into the third dimension, of course. So this gives us Q of X minus P of Y. Now, I believe we're ready to take a look at examples five and six. So let me go ahead and share my screen again so that you can see what we're doing. In example five, we're given a two-dimensional vector field, which is rotational. It's the vector field negative Y comma X. And we want to show that the curl is not zero. In other words, it is going to tend to rotate in place as it moves around the circle. So if we imagine the calculator as a leaf, it's going to spin in this direction as it goes around in a circle. So it's spinning in place and going around the circle at the same time. So in that case, we need to find the curl, which is the partial of Q with respect to X minus the partial of P with respect to Y, and prove that this does not end up being the zero vector. Pause the video to work it out, then turn it back on so we can compare. So as you have learned to do, you're going to take the partial of Q with respect to X. Q is the second component, which is X, and the partial would give me a one. Then I take the partial of P with respect to Y, and P is negative Y, so the partial gives me negative one. The formula for curl subtracts these two cross partial derivatives, and I get one minus a negative one or two, meaning that the curl is going to be 2K at all points. Let's go ahead and take a look at this now out on Calcplot 3 d And again, I'm going to unshare my screen so that you can see it rotate better. So when I'm looking at this on Calcplot 3 d you'll see that we did in fact find that at all points in this vector field, the vector around which it's rotating is 2K. In other words, the vector 0, 0, 2. So it's out in the k hat direction with a magnitude of two, which is the tendency of it to rotate in place. The larger the coefficient, the faster it rotates. The smaller the coefficient in terms of absolute value, the slower it rotates. And which direction it rotates is determined by the sign of the coefficient. Let's now take a look at example six. In example six, we want to find the curl of a three-dimensional vector field at a particular point. So first, we're going to find a formula for the curl of the vector field, which of course is a vector, and then we'll evaluate it at a particular point to know the specific vector around which it rotates at that point. 
we're going to take a look at sine x cosine z for p, sine y sine z for q, cosine x cosine y for z. Now we need to apply the formula, which you see here, or more likely what you're going to do is write this as a pseudo three by three matrix. I, J, K for row one, the operator partials row two, P, Q, R for row three, and then find the determinant. Don't forget that another method of doing it is to repeat columns one and two, and then take the major diagonals minus the minor diagonals. Go ahead and pause the video to work this one out and then turn the video back on and we'll work through it together. So in order to find the curl of a three-dimensional vector field, I'm gonna create that pseudo three by three matrix. And I write I, J, I hat J hat K hat for row one, the partial operations for row two, and P, Q, and R in order for row three. Now you do have the option of repeating columns one and two to the right, and then multiplying the three major diagonals and subtracting the three minor diagonals. But you can also instead expand by row one. You'll want to expand by I, J, K because the middle row is an operation which has to be applied to a function. So I'm gonna cross out column one and row one, and I'm gonna take the partial with respect to y of cosine x cosine y, and subtract the partial with respect to z of sine y sine z. When I do that, I get i hat times negative cosine x sine y minus sine y cosine z. This is a formula for the first component of the curl vector. Then I wanna cross out column two, and again, I'm gonna cross out row one. Then I'm gonna take the partial with respect to x of cosine x cosine y, and subtract the partial with respect to z of sine x cosine z. Because j hat is in an odd position, first row, second column, I multiply it by a negative. This gives me negative j hat, times negative sine x cosine y minus a negative sine x sine z, which gives me a double negative, so it becomes positive. Finally, I want to cross out column three and row one. And when I do the derivative or the determinant of the two by two matrix, I get the partial with respect to x of sine y sine z, but that doesn't depend on x, which means that the partial derivative becomes zero. And then I subtract the partial with respect to y of sine x cosine z, but it doesn't depend on y, so I end up with zero minus zero, or zero in the k hat direction. So the third component of my curl vector is going to be zero. Let's now evaluate this at our point, which is zero pi over two pi over two. So I went ahead and wrote the final value down here and factored out a constant factor from each one to make it slightly easier to plug in. So the sine of y becomes sine of pi over two, which becomes one. So we have a negative one. Cosine of zero is one, plus the cosine of pi over two is zero. So I get a negative one times one. So I get a negative one in the i hat direction. Negative sine of zero, since x is zero, gives me zero and zero times anything is zero, which must mean that the vector around which this um, particular point is rotating is the vector negative i hat. Let's go ahead and take a look at that now out on calcplot 3D. I can find my cursor. So here we go. When I'm out here, again, notice that I have entered pi over two for the y component, pi divided by two for the z component, and calcplot 3D will automatically convert them to decimals, and zero for the x component. This is the point that was given, zero pi over two, pi over two.
When I do that, then I want to evaluate the curl. This time, after I've plotted the vector field, I do not want to restrict it to a 2D view. So leave that box unchecked. Then you want to do the curl at a point, and you can notice here that it is rotating. Let me stop sharing so that you can see the rotation better. When we see this here, you can tell that it's rotating, and it's rotating about a light green vector, which is pointing in the direction of the negative x-axis, and the length of the vector is 1. So it's pointing in the direction of negative i. When we look at this, and we evaluate it at different points, we're going to get a different curl vector. Let's go back and evaluate it at a different point. Let's say we evaluate it at pi over 2, 0, pi over 2. This time, y is 0, so sine of 0 is 0, so the first component is going to drop out. <clears throat> Sorry, clearing my throat here. So sine of y is going to be 0, so it's going to drop out. So I don't have anything in the i hat component. And then I've got sine of 0 again dropping out. And then, well, hang on, this just gives me 0, 0, 0, which is a little bit of a problem in this case. So I've got a curl vector, which is giving me the 0 vector, all right? What does that mean? Well, that means at the point pi over 2, 0, pi over 2, it must not be curling. So let's take a look at that particular point. So I'm going to enter pi divided by 2, if I can find divided, divided by 2, 0, and pi divided by 2. And there it is. And it's not rotating at all. You can see it's just sitting there. It's not rotating. The curl is the 0 vector. All right. It's not curling. All right. So in this sense, it's not curling in a loop. If I evaluate this at a different point, I'm trying to think what point I have not evaluated yet. Let's suppose that I evaluated it at pi over 2, pi over 2, um, 0. Let's do that one. I haven't done that one yet. Let's evaluate it pi over 2, pi over 2, and 0. If I do that, then I notice that it again is pointing in the negative i hat direction. What would happen if I did pi over 2, pi over 2, pi over 2? They're not always going to point in the negative i hat direction. So let's do pi divided by 2 and see what happens. And this time I see that it's pointing in the negative j hat direction. So it's actually rotating around an axis that is similar to z it's just it's hard to tell because we're in 3d and it should be like parallel but we can't see it if they put it parallel so in fact the vector that it's rotating around in this case is j hat so if i rotate it a little bit like this so you can see the z or xz plane you can see that it is rotating around the negative j hat vector all right, which is pointing in the direction of negative y with a magnitude of 1. Now that we've taken a look at what curl is, let's do applications of the curl like we did for applications of the divergence. In this case, we want to think of them um, as being related to something else. We saw that flux and divergence were related, and it turns out that curl and circulation are related. Remember that because the curl is defined as a vector containing the difference of the cross partials, that we know that the conservative vector field will have a curl of zero. Let's relate it now to circulation. We're going to start in a plane since Green's theorem applies in the plane. We have a vector field F of PQ. And we take the curl of f and we dot it with k. If we dot the curl of f with k, we should get a scalar value because the dot product of two vectors is a scalar. Now we know the curl of f in a two dimensional is the partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y. 
k dot k is the vector 0, 0, 1 dotted with 0, 0, 1, which gives us 0 plus 0 plus 1, which just gives us 1. So we get the scalar valued function, partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y. Let's remind ourselves then of what the circulation form of Green's theorem is again. And again, we have our four, three, two conditions. The curve has to be piecewise smooth. It has to be simple, can intersect itself. It has to make a closed loop and we wanna orient it counterclockwise. The region has three conditions, open, simple, meaning no hole inside the domain, and connected, walk anywhere in the domain to any other point in the domain. We're gonna let D be the region inside the boundary curve C. Then our vector field has two conditions. The component functions are continuous and they have partial derivatives. If that's the case, then we can write that f dot t ds, where t is the unit tangent vector, giving us the circulation around a closed curve, which of course we know for a conservative vector field, the circulation is zero. This gives us f dot dr, or converting it into a parameterized integral of t, we get f of r of t dot r prime of t dt, this gives us the circulation formula, p dx plus q dy, which is circulation around a line integral, a closed curve, becomes the double integral over the region on the inside d of the partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y times the dA differential. However, we've already discovered from what we have up above that this partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y is going to give us the curl dotted with vector k. So we've got the curl times k dotted with k, and since a unit vector dotted with itself gives us one, then we're able to write it in this form here. All right. So we can think of the curl, again, as we did divergence, as a sort of derivative for f. And again, Green's theorem says we can evaluate this derivative of f, this curl, on a region by finding the line integral around the boundary of the region instead, which is an analog for the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now we want to see how this relates to a gravitational field. In a gravitational field, remember that it is a radial field. So things are coming in towards the source of the gravitational field. So for example, we can picture Earth with all of the vectors pointing in towards Earth and getting longer as they get closer to Earth because the effect of gravity is greater when you're closer. In this case though, because it's a radial field, it's not going to spin, all right? Everything's coming directly in at an angle towards the origin, which means it's following a direct linear path. There's no curve to your flow line. So it's not gonna to wanna to curl in place. So in this case, the curl of a gravitational field is zero. So we can compute the curl to see if it could be a gravitational field by determining if the curl of the vector field is zero. In the case that the curl is zero, we call that kind of vector field irrotational, meaning not rotational, meaning it doesn't rotate in place at that particular point. Let's take a look now at example seven, and I'll share my screen with you so we can see it a little bit better. In example seven, we're given a vector field of negative y divided by quantity x squared plus y squared, comma, x divided by quantity x squared plus y squared. We're told that this models the flow of a fluid. So we can think of this probably as a velocity vector field representing the velocity of the flow at a particular point. 
we want to show that if you drop a leaf into this fluid, say it's a river, then as the leaf moves over time, the leaf does not rotate in place. So it flows with the river in the direction that it's going, but it doesn't rotate as it moves along, all right? And the way to do that is to show that the curl is zero. So go ahead and pause the video and compute the curl. Remember that the curl for a two-dimensional vector field is given by the partial of Q with respect to X minus the partial of P with respect to Y times the K unit basis vector. Pause the video now to work this one out. To find the curl, we first compute the partial of Q with respect to X. That's given here in gray. That's going to give me the partial with respect to X of X divided by X squared plus Y squared. I applied the quotient rule to find the partial derivative, which gave me Y squared minus X squared divided by the quantity X squared plus Y squared, all squared. Then I need to find the partial of P with respect to Y and subtract it from the partial of Q with respect to X. The partial of P with respect to Y is going to be the partial of negative Y divided by X squared plus Y squared, which is pictured here in pink. Again, I applied the quotient rule to find the partial derivative with respect to Y, which gave me, again, Y squared minus X squared divided by the quantity X squared plus Y squared, all squared. Because the partial with, of Q with respect to X and the partial of P with respect to Y are identical, when I subtract them, I'm going to get zero in the K hat direction, which is just going to give me the zero vector. When I think about it then, what it means is that there's no curl. In this vector field, it does not tend to rotate. Let's take a look at this one in Calc Plot 3D. No matter where I click in this vector field, it does not rotate. No matter what point I put it at, that little paddle wheel is not going around. If you want, though, you can kind of look at the flow lines, and it's a little bit surprising in some ways that there is, in fact, no curl because it does form loops, but it's forming parts of a circle. And because of the nature of this vector field, and because the magnitudes are similar, we end up with there being no curl. We now want to take a look at using divergence and curl. So since the curl itself, it can be represented as a vector field, a vector which depends on x, y, and or z. What would happen if you took the divergence of a curl vector field? Now remember, divergence predicts the amount of net flow across a point. So it's the flow out minus the flow in. On the other hand, curl represents the tendency to stay in place and not flow out. So we might expect that if we take the divergence of a curl vector field, it's not going to flow out. In other words, the divergence of the curl will be zero. And this is what happens. Let's go ahead and take a look at this theorem now. Suppose we have a three-dimensional vector field, PQR, such that the component functions are continuous and have second order partial derivatives. Then we can compute the divergence of the curl, which gives us del dot, well, the curl itself is del cross some other vector field, which we don't know about. And that sort of gives us del dot del cross f, which sort of makes sense that we're not going to get anything. This is going to give us the divergence of the curl, which is going to be zero. Now, this theorem can be used to determine if a vector field is the curl of a different vector field. So if a vector field is the curl of some other vector field, then its divergence has to be zero. 
Now that won't be a proof, but if we can prove the divergence of a vector field is not zero, then it's not possible for it to be the curl of a different vector field. Let's take a look at example eight. In example eight, if I can scroll down, we are asked to determine if it's possible for the three-dimensional vector field sine x comma cosine y comma sine of x, y, z to be the curl of a vector field. If it is the curl of a vector field, its divergence must be zero because it's not flowing out, it's curling in place. So let's go ahead and compute the divergence of the vector field. So to apply the divergence to this vector field, we apply del dot g, which is gonna be the partial of sine x with respect to x, plus the partial of cosine y with respect to y, plus the partial of sine of x, y, z with respect to z. Go ahead and compute this now and see whether or not you get a zero vector. If you get a zero vector, it's possible, but not guaranteed. If you don't get a zero vector, if it depends on where you are in the vector field, then it's definitely not the curl of another vector field. Go ahead and pause the video to work it out, then turn the video back on and we'll work it together. When I apply the del operator to the vector field G, I get cosine X minus sine Y plus XY times the cosine of XYZ. This is not a zero vector. The value of the curl vector is gonna depend on what point I'm at XYZ. Since it's not zero for all points XYZ, then G cannot be the curl of a different vector field. It's simply not possible. Let's now take a look at the relationship of divergence and curl to conservative vector fields. We've already seen the relationship between divergence and a source-free field, and that in a simply connected domain, being source-free means that your divergence is zero. Can we establish a similar relationship between curl and conservative? And the answer is yes, we can. Conservative vector fields, while not common in the real world, are nevertheless common in what we study. We study a lot of fluid mechanics, we study a lot of gravitational fields and magnetic fields, and these are fields that conserve energy, and that makes them conservative vector fields. So when we think about a vector field F, P, Q, R, or P, Q in two dimensions, if it's conservative, then because it has the cross partial property as a conservative vector field, then we know that the curl of F must be the zero vector. We show the proof for three dimensions, but the proof for two dimensions is similar. Since it is conservative, it has the cross partial property, which tells you that the partial of P with respect to Y equals the partial of Q with respect to X and so on. Because the definition of the curl is the difference of the cross partials as the components of I, J, and K, each of these will give us zero times I, J, K, and that will give us a zero vector. And that means that the curl of the vector field is zero. If we think about a conservative vector field as the gradient of some potential function, del of lowercase letter f, then we can write that the curl of del of f, where f is that potential function that we found earlier in this chapter, then we know that the curl of del of f, since it's conservative by definition, must also be the zero vector. But using the del operator notation, this means that del crossed with del of the potential function, lowercase f, is also the zero vector. The way to remember this is that when you cross a vector with itself, you get the zero vector. And in a sense, since we have del crossed with del, we are crossing it with itself. So we do get the zero vector. We have one last theorem 
to cover, which we've already discussed earlier in the notes. And that is if F equal to PQR or PQ is a vector field in space on a simply connected domain, then saying that the curl of F is zero vector is the same as saying that F is a conservative vector field. Again, we have to add in the extra condition that the domain must be simply connected, but then saying that a vector field is conservative is the same as saying that the curl is zero, right? And the proof of this is, again, saying that the curl is zero. If the curl is zero, the only way for it to be zero is if the cross partials are equal. And if the cross partials are equal on a simply connected domain, meeting all the other conditions as well, then we know that it has to be a conservative vector field. And that ends the proof. What about the curl of a gradient? What's the curl of a gradient? So what's the upshot of all of this? If our domain is simply connected, then we can test to see whether or not F is conservative by checking to see if the curl is the zero vector. Those are equivalent statements on a simply connected domain. Since the curl of a gradient, del of lowercase f, is the zero vector, what's the divergence of a gradient? Well, let's suppose that we're in two dimensions so that our potential function f is a function of two variables, f of x and y. This is the lowercase f, the potential function. Then what is the divergence of del of f? Remember that del of f, well, del of f is equal to the partial derivative, when we think of it, of f with respect to x, comma, the partial of f with respect to y. And then the divergence of that applies that operator again so that we end up with the second partial. So we have del of f, and let's use our partial notation, f sub x, f sub y. This is going to give me the second partial with respect to x both times of f plus the second partial of f with respect to y both times. But this is related, of course, to the Laplace operator. So when we're thinking of this one, it's almost like we're doing del dot del of lowercase letter f. And we can represent this with del squared of f, and we can actually write this as del squared of f. And it gives us the second partial with respect to x both times of f plus the second partial of y with respect to, or a second partial of f with respect to y both times. This is called the Laplace operator. In three dimensions, we would add the second partial of f with respect to z both times. We know that this has applications to harmonic functions, which are involved in fields such as or heat transfer, fluid flow, other fields like this. So we know that the Laplace operator has a wide application in many of the situations that we want to study in engineering and physics. This is the end of the video over section 6.5 on divergence and curl. We've spent quite some time now talking about line integrals and converting them into double integrals over regions. So we know how to integrate across a curve. However, what if we wanted to integrate across a surface where the surface is not entirely flat? In this case, we are going to need what's called a surface integral. In the next section, we'll be learning how to integrate across a surface as opposed to a closed curve or an open curve in two or three dimensional space. Join me for the next video in this series.